Stoughton Media Access Corporation is pleased to present International Forum, a new cable show of interest, periodically interviewing foreign newsmakers, bringing them from across the ocean directly to your living room. Here's your host for this week's show, Joseph Feaster. Hello and welcome to another edition of International Forum. I'm Joseph Feaster, the host of the program, and I welcome you into, well, I hope to welcome myself into your living room to discuss international issues which would be of importance to you. Today we'd like to talk about a country which is the second populous country in the, uh, in the world. It is the second uh, largest uh, um, democratic democracy, and it is the seventh largest country by area. And what I'm speaking about is the Republic of India. And with me today, I have a person who uh, was in India, lived in India for a uh, considerable period of time. Uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, had in fact uh, had been here in Boston as with the Boston Globe, has served as the Southeast Asia um, editor for the Washington Post, or bureau chief, excuse me, for the Washington Post. And that person who is with me is Ken Cooper, and I'd like you to welcome him. So Ken, uh, welcome to International Forum. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, and, you know, you, you've had an illustrious career. I've known you for quite some period of time when you were at the Boston Globe. I learned in our most recent conversation about your positions with the uh, Washington Post, and I was very excited and by uh, our conversations about the time that you spent in India. So why don't you tell us when that time was, exactly uh, what you were, uh, were doing there, and then I want to get into, because I know the president just recently visited India, there's a lot going on as far as trade. I want to explore a number of those issues with you. So why don't you first uh, let our viewing audience know a little bit more about Ken Cooper. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, I was the uh, South Asia Bureau Chief for the Washington Post from 1996 to 1999, three years. Three or four years as a standard rotation for a foreign correspondent. I was based in New Delhi, uh, which is traditional for the Washington Post. And my patch, as it were, was the entire Indian subcontinent, uh, which included Afghanistan and Pakistan and Bangladesh and to the south Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Um, my mission there, I had a lot of autonomy. Uh, this was a case where literally I was uh, nine or ten hours ahead of the main office. <laughs> so it was hard for them to tell me what to do. Uh, and more often I was informing them what I planned to do. Uh, and I wrote a lot about um, <clears throat> politics. I covered two Indian elections. Uh, there was a lot of big news that broke out on my watch. Um, uh, the dear Mother Teresa uh, died while I was there. India, then Pakistan, conducted nuclear weapons tests. Uh, the Taliban took over Afghanistan for the first time. Uh, Benazir Bhutto, who was educated partly here in this area at Harvard, was deposed as uh, uh, Pakistan's prime minister. Uh, in addition to so those breaking stories, I wrote a lot about uh, the status of women. I wrote about the uh, continuing influence of caste in that society which I often say is uh, probably the most socially complex society country on the face of the earth and possibly the most diverse because you can cut it a lot of different ways by language, by caste, by region, um, uh, by religion. Um, and of those, in some ways, my interpretation of what was most important in India differed from other previous correspondents and maybe some today because uh, from my outlook, the most important socioeconomic fact in India is caste. It is you not know, religion. And, and you know, I, uh, <coughs> I always try to do my homework when I have a guest and to begin to learn about it. And I have to quite honestly have to say that in doing some of my research, I learned a number of things. And, and I know we talked uh, before the show about the caste system, and I want to come back to that. But I, I also want to put things in perspective uh, because what I found curious as well was in each instance when I look at how things are divided up in parts of the world, I always see the British influence in there. I saw it as I, in previous shows, I've spoken with um, a former Israeli ambassador, and I've talked about what 
uh, the British did in terms of dividing up Palestine uh, back in, uh, I believe it was 19, around the same time, almost like 1947, 1957, I forget the exact time frame. But here in India, India in the division uh, and, and dividing India and Pakistan, which to this day is, has created the conflict. In, in your time over there, did you see the repercussions from that? Because we were talking earlier about how the Constitution was established in India in the 1950. We talked about Gandhi, who was very much involved in the, during the time of the creation of India in 1947. Can you talk about a little bit of that history and, 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 and help us do that? Surely. Um, uh, while I was in India, uh, the 50th anniversary of both companies and countries occurred, and I wrote a piece that sort of talked about uh, two countries born at the stroke of midnight <laughs> at the same moment and how they had evolved differently in terms of governance. Um, uh, you know, the India, the British colonial India was broader than the India of today. It included Pakistan, it included Myanmar slash Burma, uh, going further back, it included a piece of what is now Afghanistan. Um, and so the independence movement in India, uh, which uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, Mohandas Gandhi uh, led, um, the Indian National Congress was the name of the principal movement, and it very much was a Congress. It was a coalition of people who didn't necessarily same, uh, share the same ideologies or the same religion. Uh, the man who became the founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, started out in the Indian National Congress. Uh, and what developed during that period, I mean, there had been Hindu-Muslim tensions and riots during British colonial times. Um, there became a movement among Muslims that started relatively late in the independence push to have a separate Muslim state that would serve as a haven from Hindu predations upon Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, this was first initiated maybe 10 or 15 years before independence happened, whereas the idea of an India, a multi-religious uh, India, had gone back closer to the early 1900s and was very well articulated and thought out. Um, so after World War II, when the British Empire was spent, and not just in India, but around the world from having, you know, staved off the Nazis and the Japanese during World War II, uh, negotiations started on, um, uh, on independence for India and the notion of a two-state solution, where we heard that before, Yes. <laughs> with a, a separate Pakistan. Yes. And there was a British, uh, I think he was a cartographer, but he had some scientific background, who drew a line. Um, the Durand Line that served... Sounds so much like Israel. <laughs> yeah, that served as the, the separation between uh, ma majority Muslims India, uh, majority Muslim areas of British colonial India and predominantly Hindu areas of British colonial India. Uh, there were two problems right away. Uh, is that one area was to the west of India, which is what we now think of Pakistan, and one predominantly Muslim area was to the east of India, which is today, originally was East Pakistan, but now it's today Bangladesh. And you had in between a thousands, more than a thousand miles of Indian territory. Um, <clears throat> and then it got even trickier when there was a state, a, a, a princely state that was controlled by a Muslim in the center of India in a city called Hyderabad in South Central India. And he wanted to go with Pakistan. And Nehru wasn't having a <laughs> Muslim majority polity in the middle of his country. And yes. the Nizam of Hyderabad was rich. All right. So Nehru's troops quashed that idea. And then the second big problem, which is with us today, is the, the state of Kashmir, which is a lovely Himalayan country, uh, territory, I should say to the north of Pakistan. And to the south, to the east of Pakistan, sort of north of India, it's uh, uh, so far north it has a temperate climate. It snows in Kashmir. They have beautiful mountains. Uh, 
uh, and lovely streams. They grow a lot of wonderful fruits there. Mm -hmm. And it was majority Muslim. And actually the, the leader, the Muslim leader of uh, Kashmir kind of dithered about whether or not he wanted to go with Pakistan or he wanted to go with India. And this was pretty late in the day. Uh, and then finally Pakistan, the newly created Pakistan, sit in some tribesmen, armed tribesmen, basically to capture Kashmir. And uh, the, the leader, the Muslim leader of Kashmir put in a call to Nehru and basically said, send troops, give me some help. <laughs> and that's how he made his decision. Right. And that was the first war between India, of, you know, several wars between India and Pakistan, most of them having to do with this disputed territory of Kashmir, which is divided now between Pakistan and India in terms of who controls what part. And it's not an international border between those two parts. It's what's called a line of control. <laughs> you know, it, 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 um, <clears throat> that history is one which I would think that I certainly, and I consider myself well read, uh, was unaware of, and I suspect most of the viewing audiences. At some point in time after this divide, if you will, uh, uh, created by uh, the, the British, and they went through. At some point in time, India did, because it, it's known as the um, most populous democracy, they created a constitution. Um, and I believe that was in 1950. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that too um, will lead us into our discussion about the caste system. Uh, because there were some things that were addressed in the Constitution. Could you talk about that a bit? Sure. Uh, while I was posted in India for the Washington Post, the 50th anniversary, the two countries came up. And uh, uh, as soon as I arrived there, I had in mind that I would do a substantial story about the two countries and how they developed in the intervening 50 years and came soon to see that there were different patterns in their development. And one of the things I did in both the cases of India and Pakistan, I went back and found a few surviving members of what was known in each country as the Constituent Assembly, the sort of representative body uh, that was to write the Constitution or vet the Constitution. Uh, in India, um, uh, the sort of you know, drafting of the Constitution uh, was led by a man um, who was then called an untouchable, the modern term is Dalit, D-A-L-I-T, named B R. Ambedkar. And Ambedkar had fallen in with some Christian missionaries as a young man who educated him. And he wound up coming to the United States to get a law degree from Columbia University. And then he went back to India. And he was actually charged with leading the drafting of the Indian Constitution. And it was a very well researched effort. And they looked at constitutions from around the world, including ours. And in fact, if you read the Indian Constitution, which is the world's longest constitution, uh, you'll find many provisions that parallel uh, provisions in our own constitution. Um, so, and Becker's leading this effort. And one of the questions that came up had to do with the caste system, uh, which is a function of the Hindu religion. It's contained explicitly in an, an ancient Hindu text and ordered its life uh, traditionally in India by occupation, social status, who you can marry, uh, and the like. And Ambedkar, the untouchable slash Dalit, his idea was to ban the caste system under the Constitution. Gandhi, although he didn't have an official position in the Constitution writing, he's sort of like the symbolic uh, and in some ways leader of the independence movement. Uh, and Gandhi had a different idea. His idea was um, what we should ban is discrimination based on caste. And ultimately, Gandhi carried the day. So the Indian Constitution bans discrimination based on caste. And in some ways, but not the caste system, in some ways you could see the practical point to Gandhi's argument. Mm -hmm. It would be like if in this country we wrote a document that said we're going to ban race. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it's such a part yeah. of our history. You cannot ban the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we've tried to do, and explicitly done in our constitutional and statutory arrangements, is to ban discrimination based on race. But the other part of it, too, is that, you know, Gandhi was very enlightened when it came to caste. 
and, and, and in his compound, his ashram, you know, he did tasks that only heretofore uh, untouchables would do, like cleaning bathrooms and toilets, and insisted others do. But Gandhi was attached to his own caste identity. Uh, his autobiography, The Story of My Experiments with Truth, the very first sentence is an assertion of his caste identity. He tells readers that Gandhi means grocer, and he's from a caste of grocers, and he doesn't say it there, but you can look it up. Grocers is sort of the bottom of the high caste in India, um, the it's trader class. Two <clears throat> things I want to, because I, I want to drill down just a little bit more on so people can get a true sense of the caste system. I, you know, here in the States, we hear it. Mm. We hear it mentioned that there's a caste. I want to drill down to get some information. But it was fascinating for me also to read there are more than 2,000 ethnic groups in India. When you start talking about the, the concept of where you can understand where Gandhi was coming from, it would be a, a, akin to trying to eradicate race here mm. in the United States. There we have multiplicity of religions, small groups, large groups. It's different by regions. Uh, there is, a, like I said, there's 2,000 ethnic groups. I suspect that that's what embodies much of the conversation and the conflict that oftentimes might exist because of all of these differences mm. that might exist. But, you know, if you could talk a little bit more, what does the caste, describe the caste system as you, as you know it. Mm. Uh, it's just now, and, and I'll just say, in some of my readings, some try to put it in the hands of the, because of the British mm. allowed it in, in their colonialism, they allowed it certain people to get jobs from certain, certain religions, certain ethnic groups versus others, and that they perpetuated this. Uh, and some seem to suggest that, oh, India no longer has the caste system. And I know you visited this. So I'd like you to talk about the caste system and see whether this literature is accurate from what your observations were. Well, you know, first, it you know, sound a little primerish, but, you know, we had to sort of define what the caste system is. Yes. You know, it is a Hindu thing. It is a religious hierarchy that bears on social status and also occupation. And there are four main castes, and then there are many subdivisions within those. At the top are the Brahmins. Um, when we talk about, you know, our chattering classes as being pundits, Yes. You know, Pandit is actually the name of a Brahmin class. They were scribes, religious scribes traditionally. Next are the warriors, okay? Uh, Sutriya is the way it can be said in Sanskrit. And then beneath that are the Banya, the traders. Sort of in our system of class, this is sort of the middle class, the, the, the petty, the small shopkeepers. Then beneath that are the Sudra, the laborers. Now the thing that, and that's a hierarchy from top to bottom. And the way it works, you're born into a caste, you will forever be in that caste, with very few traditional exceptions, and your children will be born into that caste and be there forever. And those castes were endogamous, traditionally, that Brahmins married Brahmins, warriors married warriors, traders married tra traders, and Shudras married Shudras. Now, many of these people in this country have heard of untouchables. And the thing that is a little subtle and difficult to understand is that actually untouchables are outside of the caste system. Uh -huh. They're not even on the ladder. And that's where we get our word outcast from. They're outcased. They're at the bottom, uh, but they have no prospect. There were some ways through marriage and some other things that you could move up in the caste system. But they were outside of it. They were just, you know, and they're at the very bottom. So you have the hierarchy, and you could tell by some of the names that it defines occupation. You know, the Brahmins were uh, priests and religious scribes in the modern time, the journalistic class, uh, uh, the educated uh, professors, uh, the teachers tend to be Brahmins in India. The warriors is kind of obvious. I'm sure there's plenty of a strong presence of the warrior caste in the Indian military. Uh, the, 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 the traders, uh, um, you know, modern day trade, perhaps in the corporate world, but mostly shopkeepers. And then the, the laborers, you're talking about basically farm laborers. Now when it comes to the untouchables, 
they had all the dirty jobs, <laughs> okay. all right, uh, which in the eyes of Hinduism were polluting of the human being. So um, untouchables traditionally were, uh, had occupations like the removal of animal waste from the streets, the removal of human waste from homes, the tanning of animal hides, which was considered polluting. You know, the top caste of Brahmas are vegetarian, so this touching meat and dead animals is, you know, considered polluting. Uh, or even dealing with uh, the production of alcoholic beverages. You know, again, alcohol in the classic traditional Hindu view was thought to be a polluting uh, substance. Um, so that was the tradition. The Constitution of 1950 banned caste, the discrimination based on caste. And it did another thing, which is very interesting from our point of view. Um, right after it has our version of the Equal Protection Clause, there's something that says, notwithstanding the former provision, nothing shall, uh, not, notwithstanding the former reservations, in our language, quotas for the lower caste in the Constitution, the scheduled caste, are authorized. Okay. So since 1950, India has had quotas, and they're like 12.34%, I mean very specific quotas, in government jobs and in university placements for the lower caste, who, by the way, make up the majority of society. The Brahmins are a minority. They're a minority that dominate most sectors of life in India in terms of governance and the corporate world, uh, the elite if you want to, if you say so, but they're a minority uh, of people. Uh, it's almost like our one percenters here in terms of uh, financially that yeah. uh, uh, who basically uh, because of their wealth and status are, are in control. Yeah, they're in control. All I would, one caution is, I mean, there's a certain strain of Brahmanism that sort of recalls it the notion of accumulating wealth. So not all Brahmins are wealthy, but they are powerful as a caste, by and large, um, and educated. I mean, one of the things that Brahmins mm -hmm. are into is education, but it's also kind of an education. It's like it's our thing. It's for us. It's not so much about spreading education, but acquiring knowledge and education for ourselves. It, interesting, uh, because I want to just draw some parallels to here. Uh, for instance, where were those uh, in the medical prof professions? I says, you know, I see quite a number as I go to hospitals in terms of doctors, um, you know, male and female, and I want to talk about the female issue in, in a moment as well. Um, where would that fall uh, in that? And then the other thing is, the U.S. is trying to open up trade in, in India and with our own types of rules and beliefs that we do have uh, and the issues of uh, definitely gender equality, uh, at least professed as, the, as such. Um, how does that really play out? And I know, again, when you start talking about colleges that are going to India and establishing it there, how does all of this fit in for what you observed while you were over there, Ken? I mean, it's... I, 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 well, you know, one of the things when it comes to, you know, you write that caste system doesn't sort of say that these are where the doctors are. But if you meet doctors of Indian descent in the United States, the safe assumption I would make is that they're Brahmins. Not all of them. I know when I lived in D.C., I met an oncologist, an Indian oncologist, who has asserted the fact that he was an untouchable. Uh, but it is the Brahmins who... Um, in India have access, have had longer access to higher education, uh, larger ambitions for education, uh, who've come here in some numbers to get educated. Indians are one of the most educated immigrant groups in this country. Um, and maybe the most. I've heard different things about whether some West African groups fall into that category too. Um, and as far as trade, I mean actually, you know, Starting with Nehru, who was the first prime minister of India, India had a sort of closed economy where, um, and Nehru's impulses weren't all bad. Um, the British had denied Indians access to technology and higher level jobs. You know, the Gandhi protest about, you know, we grow the cotton 
and we spin the thread and then you send it to Manchester and you make these textiles and you mark up the price and you sell it to us so we have clothes to wear. Uh, so one of Nehru's objectives was for Indians <coughs> uh, to develop their own technological capacity. So he closed the economy uh, and created what was known as the License Raj. You know, here, you know, some of our politicians complain about government picking winners and losers in the corporate business world. Well, that's exactly what India did. There were only so many companies that were authorized to make certain things. Um, and decades later, the upshot was that India had a broad industrial base, but because it had been protected from competition, the quality of those projects were uneven. And it really wasn't until the first Persian Gulf War and, and the notion of globalization that India started to open up its economy to Western investment. Uh, and it did so gradually and tentatively because uh, there were great fears in India that if we open up our, co our country too fast to foreign investors, that the modern day equivalent of the British East India Company will show up and say they want to trade with us and next thing they know they'll be ruling us. Uh, although the one historic difference is, is when the British East, East India Company arrived in the 1600s, India was not a unified state. It was a collection of small princely states in you know, a defined geographic area. So the caste system, to sort of tie a little knot on this, has been breaking down. These quotas have helped create a middle class of, uh, uh, from the lower caste, the Sudras even untouchables who are also, you know, uh, eligible for quotas. You have Western companies come in, uh, Westerners like me, who when I was there I had a domestic and office staff, uh, Americans who, you know, we at least have the egalitarian idea and this notion of a rigid hierarchy is anathema to us. So I made it very clear to my staff this, you know, this caste business distinctions, I'm not playing that. <laughs> uh, I had Hindus and Christians on my staff. I didn't have any Muslims, I would have been happy to. Uh, there's, you know, intercommunal uh, conflict and dissent, I'm not gonna have any of that. Each of you works for me, I accord you your respect as humans and I expect you to accord respect to your coworkers. So you have those kind of messages coming from Westerners, so it's softening it, but uh, it hasn't gone away. Um, the inequity hasn't gone away. Um, and the other thing that's helped sort of break it down is that when I was there actually, the lower caste were beginning to organize political parties around their caste structures uh, so that you'd have these lower caste parties who would say things like, cast your vote <laughs> to your caste. Okay. And you'd wind up with, you know, parliaments or state legislators where you'd had hung parliaments or hung state legislators. You need coalition governments and these lower caste parties, you know, got a chance to rule in some places. They got to be partners in coalitions where they had influence. So the, the notion that the lower caste are on the bottom, uh, socioeconomically, is is loosening. Yeah, there's still disparities. Well, I want to come back and talk about, because India has a parliamentary system. They, they have almost a federal uh, government, much like the United States, but they also have the parliamentary system, which I guess would be akin to what the British have. Yes, it's the Westminster uh, system from the British. Right. Uh, but what I, I want to explore a little bit more, taking this caste system uh, concept just a little bit further. And that is on the question of the male dominance, the female, you know, though they were talked about, I know it's been banned, but I'm not sure that it's taken away three issues. One is the, in, I think it's infanticide. Uh, the other one, I don't want to mispronounce it, but it's involved in terms of uh, the killing of the, uh, you know, the identification of a fetus, and if it's a, and if it's a female, mm. uh, they will, uh, kill in womb, uh, and then the other one is in terms of the whole concept of arranged marriages. Yeah, um, some background sort of helps. I mean, basically, and it's not uh, unique to India, but you know, having sons is favored over daughters quite a lot, even in this day. Um, 
And there's a traditional reason that, for that that helps understand how this evolved. It's a cultural, religious reason. In India, uh, uh, when a young girl or a, a girl or a young woman gets married, what happens is she moves in with her husband's family. They have a joint family structure. Sort and of the like, dowry as well, it yes, still, it still it, exists. Which is also banned. Okay. All right. All right. So, technically it's banned. <laughs> technically banned. It's technically illegal. Yes. Uh, the, the, the wife would move in with the husband's family, and they would meet two or three generations of the husband's family in the same household. And in fact, the, the newly acquired daughter-in-law, uh, the newly acquired wife, in effect becomes a slave of the mother-in-law, that the mother-in-law bosses around and treats very bad. This is traditionally, all right? Uh, all these things have been moderated in modern times. So from the point of view of the wife's family, for example, um, why would I educate my daughter when she gets married, she's gonna take the benefit of education and move in with another family? Um, and there's also the issue of dowry, that when you have daughters, you have to basically give do uh, dowries to, to, to marry them off and pay for the wedding, and that's expensive. And you have people, many poor people, who live very close to the edge who couldn't afford that. So there's a traditional saying, the Hindu saying, that actually was the title of a book that a New York Times correspondent wrote, a woman, and the saying is, may you be the mother of a hundred sons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's from that kind of mindset. Uh, and there's, this, there's an also expression, you know, you know, why would you educate your daughter? Because it's like watering the neighbor's garden. <laughs> In a country where water is scarce, right? Sure. Um, um, uh, so w what you have happen is, you know, with a mindset like that. And this goes back traditionally where, you know, girl, infant girls would be born and they would be killed. It's totally against the law. Um, uh, I have no doubt it still occurs. I think it's occurring less than it did historically. Uh, with modern technology now, you have the capacity using, you know, to, to find out the gender of a fetus in utero. Uh, and and I was reading that they have even banned that, to, uh, that one, that's not even allowed. Right. Technically, is oh, I mean, oh, all these things, we talk about things that are not allowed, that doesn't mean people aren't doing them. Right. Uh, but, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it bears on the capacity of the government or any government to enforce their laws, but certainly it's a practice that's not accepted. Now, arranged marriage um, is still probably predominant in India, where uh, instead of, a young woman and a young man deciding that they want to get married, you know. The families have a meeting, and um, it's very much like an interview in both directions, um, where they're checking on, first of all, are you you're the right cast, right? There are ways to check that. Uh, they're interested in, you know, social status, uh, how much money that family has, and that, you know, leaks into dowry and how much dowry we can get. Um, and so it's sort of an arrangement. And, you know, the male and the female who might be the intendants, you know, they only get to meet sort of after this. The business it, arrangement. The has business been. arrangement look like this is something that could work. <laughs> and it's fleeting and uh -huh. it's chaperoned traditionally. Yes. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> it's all very odd to us. Um, but there have been an increase in recent years in India where they're called love marriages, where actually the man and woman are choosing each other based on love. Uh, one of the interesting defenses I've heard of arranged marriage when I lived in India was that Indians would say, you know, your Western marriages, they start out as being love. <laughs> they end up being arrangements. <laughs> Ours thought I was being arrangements, but they wind up being love. <laughs> uh, I don't know how true it is, but you can see they have a different perspective. And I certainly actually do know couples who had been married for many years who were products of arranged marriage where you could see affection did develop, whereas 
they're basically strangers when they got married. But you could see later after children and close proximity and uh, working as a team that uh, love did blossom. So. I want to touch upon a subject which for some they may find is sensitive, but um, I think it's an important one to have a conversation on. And that would be on um, citizens of India and the relationships to the African uh, perceptions and the reviews on African Americans. And uh, your being an African American and having spent time in India, can you talk a little bit about that? Because my my concerns are, or my observations are, that with the caste system, there are certain viewpoints. If you start talking about status and you start talking about money and you start talking about different things, my sense would be, and on the most part, there would probably be some discord mm -hmm. if there was um, interrelations, marriage uh, with Indians and uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong or enlighten us all uh, on what you observed or no. I mean, one of the first things I should say, you know, India is a very complex and large country, subcontinental side, so it's hard to generalize completely about India and be accurate. Uh, but one of the things that people in this country assume about the caste system, which is not exactly correct, is there's a sense that it's color-coded, that the higher caste are lighter and the lower caste are darker. There is some correlation to that. But your skin color does not determine your caste. In South India, where nearly everybody is dark skinned, the Brahmins are dark skinned at the top. Uh, when I lived in India, the leading Dalit slash untouchable politician, he was light, bright, and almost white. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's a correlation, but it's not causation. Uh, and when it comes to arranged marriages um, uh, in Afri -American, African American terms, uh, Indians are certainly color struck. Uh, you know, families will want mates, and you will see this in ads for arranged marriages, who have a weedish complexion, in other words, light skin. Uh, when I was in India, I had a, a woman who worked for me in my office as a researcher and translator. And to African Americans, and I told her, she's a brown skin. And she ended up in a love marriage, and one of her explanations was that she was too dark, so nobody would arrange a marriage with her. And um, in this country, we wouldn't think that she was dark, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but in India, that was that perception. Um, as far as intermarriage between African Americans and Indian Americans or Indians, um, it has happened, but this color struck concept does come in there where um, parents will wonder if their children will come out being darker when what they would want is for the children of their children, their grandchildren, if you will, to be lighter, not darker. Uh, but there's a very prominent example of an African American marriage to a person of Indian descent. Her name is Kamala Harris. She's Attorney General of the state of California. Yes. And she's angling to run for the United States Senate. And I think I have this right. Her father was African American, or is, and her mother is of Indian descent. You can sort of see with the Harris being an American name, and Kamala is actually a traditional Indian name. Uh, so it does happen. Uh, you also have intermarriage between Indians and uh, white Americans and Europeans. Um, and there are even some qualms about that, about marrying foreigners and, you know, marrying someone who doesn't have caste. If traditionally you married somebody within your caste and you present an intended who does not have caste, uh, you could see how that would take some people aback, some parents. You know, that's, um, and, I, and, and, I, and I bring that subject up because as we started out the conversation, beside what transpired after the division of the area, I won't even say India, because it wasn't India at the time, into, into what you've mentioned, several uh, Pakistan, East Pakistan, Kashmir, uh, India, um, but principally when the British did it in 47, it was, uh, India and Pakistan and everything else they let them work it out 
But I would suspect that with the multiplicity of ethnic groups I mentioned, about 2,000, the multiplicity of uh, religions, you could arguably say India could be uh, you know, insular in ways and culturally in some of its thinking. And so I would suspect that some of what I've just asked and you responded to is as a result of some of its historical and cultural uh, beliefs and understandings as well. Um, but let me move for a minute. Uh, I would add one thing yeah. though, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, India <clears throat> is a big place and it does have subcontinental scale and certainly there's a certain degree even his classically and, and currently of insularity. I mean, for example, mm -hmm. the domestic market in India is big enough for a company if you produce the right things, you don't really have to worry about export as you could make your money right there in that market. But the big caveat is, is that trade, India has been engaged in trade for centuries, you know, millennia. The Silk Road passed through northern India. Uh, there was trade on vessels between India and uh, the Middle East going back. There was trade between India and the Middle East and the East Coast of Africa going back. So it hasn't been totally insular, and even today, um, you know, Mumbai, Bombay, which is on the west coast of India, uh, it's, you know, uh, both the financial center of the country, it's the entertainment capital of the country. They have their Bollywood, <laughs> okay. where they make movies, yes. uh, and it's a port. And there's a lot of foreign influence that flows through Bombay. It's a very cosmopolitan city that sometimes like to compare itself to New York, and in some ways it's similar in that there's a whole lot of people and not that much space. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about because the president, uh, President Obama, recently visited India, um, and there was much discussion, and I read his remarks that he made uh, at various times, not only when he attended the parade, which I understand was just uh, out of this world in the sense of dis demonstrating some of their cultural as well as their military uh, prowess, uh, but also speaking to the international trade groups. Um, he remarked it at, at trying to open up or to encourage more trade between the United States and, uh, and, uh, and India. Additionally, I know that you had mentioned to me that you were there and uh, during the time of the present uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi, and as I understand, that would probably be the more powerful person in the country, more so than even the President of India, uh, as, as it were. Can you talk a little about what you're having sat in your position with the Washington Post, being the bureau tree for Southeast Asia, watching all this play out? Uh, what do you make of this visit, and what does it uh, pro offer for the future with regards to U.S. India trade relations? Well, you know, uh, uh, it's pretty clear to me that President Obama's reason for going to India a second time, the first American president's been there twice while in office. And the reason India was eager to have him and happy to have him come uh, really has to do with geopolitics and the rising assertiveness of China, India's next door neighbor. And so for President Obama to show up for the Republic Day Parade where India's military and its military materiel are on display was a way of suggesting to China uh, a close relationship uh, as a counterweight, India as a counterweight to China in that part of the world. And for India to feel like China, you know, careful how you deal with us because we got this <laughs> powerful friend over here. Right. And it gets even more complicated because China has very close relations and historically has with Pakistan. Um, so I'm sure that that was the overriding reason. Part of the trade scenario actually, and I don't know how explicit the president was about this, that India, which, you know, before it opened its economy, was part of the non-aligned movement, it professed neither to be a partner of the Soviet Union or the United States during the Cold War, but in terms of trade relations, it was clearly closer to the former Soviet Union. 
and India still buys a lot of its weaponry from Russia. And the United States would like to sell India more. India might like to buy more uh, because traditionally, uh, this is where it gets complicated again recently, in, in the United States has been selling like our fighter aircraft to Pakistan. Yes, yes. <laughs> and right. India was buying its fighter aircraft from the Soviet Union. Um, so that's a part of it. Um, for uh, many American companies to look at the size of the one point almost two billion uh, population of India, that's, that's quite a market. Second populist <laughs> behind, an interesting part behind China. Yeah. And, behind. and, and about to overtake them right. by what I was reading uh, by 2025, the expectation that they'll be the most populous. Yeah. And even if you think, well, you know, a lot of Indians are pretty poor and don't have disposable income, if you just say, and I know what the current thing is, if you just say, you know, 20% of Indians are middle class or better, that's 250 million people, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or thereabouts, right? Uh, so that's a sizable market, and, and the United States has eyed that. Um, and Indian has loosened up, you know, when I was leaving there, you know, 15 years ago, the United States was trying to get India to loosen up uh, its insurance market <laughs> so that American companies could get in there. Um, and that'll be a gradual process. Um, I mean, one of the hangups traditionally has been uh, intellectual property. Uh, India has, for example, pharmaceutical drug manufacturers who are very good at making generic stuff, maybe not so much at making, you know, therapeutic breakthroughs. Uh, and their products are relatively cheap by our standards, and they need to be cheap by the income levels of Indians. And so when you start talking about, you know, the intellectual properties of American, the property of Indian, American drug companies, and India's not doing knockoffs and reverse engineering, you know, that gets tricky. Um, because you can imagine any prime minister says, I, I'm with you conceptually on, you know, people should <laughs> own their intellectual property, but you know, I'm gonna make sure my people get their medicine. My people, a lot of my people are poor. Right. And I'm gonna make sure they get their medicine. So yeah, I'll sign that document. <laughs> you just remember what I said about my people getting their medicine. <laughs> right. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I want to take the conversation as well because we've 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 spent m most of the time here talking about some of the historical aspects, some of the cultural aspects, uh, some of the political aspects, and we didn't really dwell into that, and maybe I will. I was digressing. I was going to go someplace else, but let me come back, because I had mentioned earlier on talking about the parliamentary system, because India is known as a federal republic, a constitutional republic. We talked about the Constitution, but they also have the, 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 the bases of, of the British parliamentary system. Talk a little bit about that, and then secondarily, because uh, as we the time moves on here, I want to talk about the perception in Washington and in the Congress because you've served uh, time in, in you know with, with the Washington Post in in, in uh, Washington D.C. In, in the Capitol and all. You were there during uh, uh, Boehner's uh, reign. Uh, does is there during, a during Boehner's rise? Rise. But, that's yeah. right. That's right. His rise, not his reign. Uh, but again. With all that's being discussed and with the president trying to make these moves on the trade, et cetera, how is India really perceived in, uh, you know, in, in Washington? So the parliamentary system and then the perception, the president can have one perception, as we've noticed, right. Congress could have another. Yeah. The, uh, it is a Westminster system. It's like the British system. They have a, bi a bicameral, two houses, uh, parliament, and the same with the state legislatures. Uh, the, the lower house is directly elected by people from constituencies, districts, if you will. It's called the Lok Sabha, which means the People's House, uh, which is like uh, Parliament in Britain, uh, the House of Commons. And then the upper house is called Raja Sabha, which means the Ruler's House, uh, where people are indirectly elected by state legislators sort of like the U.S. Senate was in the early years, of, uh, early decades of this country. And the Rajasabha, uh, the ruler's house, is more like the House of Lords. Okay. 
and the power really is in the Raja Sabha, the people's house. It is a federal government, but um, the central government in India um, has more authority than our United States government. Example, the central government controls all police. There's not local police forces. Okay. Uh, it's, centrally con it's centrally controlled, uh, trained, uh, as well as the bureaucracy uh, is controlled by the center, the Indian Administrative Service. Both of these and the Indian Police Service are both uh, creatures of the, the British rule. Uh, and uh, people take exams to get enter, enter into both. And it's strict rank order by score. And they're very coveted jobs because it basically, once you get in this lifetime tenure, you got to start it at the bottom <laughs> in some rural outpost doing some, you know, <laughs> magisterial kind of magistrate type job. Right. Uh, but, you know, you, you get moved up serially and, you know, you get perks like housing and you get job security, which in a country that has a labor surplus, more people than there are jobs to, for them, uh, it's very well um, uh, desired. Um, the Indian diplomatic service works the same way. Um, as far as how India is seen in Washington, that's an interesting question. Um, I think India is still um, wanting more influence in India, if I'm right, than it's had in the past. Um, you know, our government has been awfully fixated on China. Um, because of its power as a market, as its growing military strength. Um, it is the largest country. Um, uh, the differences between our straight capitalist system and their sort of blend of communism and market economy. Um, so I think India, uh, as it does in Asia, feels a little overshadowed by China. and. Uh, wants to assert itself, and this is most obvious when you sort of move out of Washington, move to New York, to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. You know, China is a permanent me member of the UN Security Council, and India is not. And India has coveted that status for a long time. And if I were to venture my personal opinion, quite frankly, India does deserve to be on an expanded permanent membership of the UN Security Council. Uh, because what we have now, those five members are representative of the victors of World War II. That was a long time ago. The world has changed. Uh, India is the world's largest democracy and a nation of color uh, should be on there. A nation from Africa could be on there, and there's a debate whether that should be South Africa or Nigeria, and um, probably Brazil. It's probably the main choice from South America. That would make for a much more representative uh, UN Security Council. That would get you to eight. So right. there'd probably be a ninth member in this, so <laughs> you have a tiebreaker. The interesting <laughs> or, as I had sometimes argued, that you know, maybe a couple of those permanent members shouldn't uh, be on there. Should be removed. Yeah, I yeah. actually have one in mind, yeah, and it, there's precedent for that because yeah. what is now Taiwan had to seek the you know, the Republic of China now occupies, and Taiwan was kicked off the UN security, the permanent membership too, so. What is interesting, I, you know, I, having uh, been a political science major and studied, of course, in terms of the UN, we have a debate about its influence, its power, and what should happen there, but, it, but it's interesting that you will raise as you begin to talk about geopolitics mm. uh, and the, sh the shifting cent centers of power, for instance, you know, uh, if just to stay on the UN for a moment, when we start talking about the Security Council and the European representatives that are on there, uh, clearly, you know, we have the Euro where everything's happening in terms of Europe. We have diminishing influences of some of the folks who are on there. Uh, certainly we could take this program <laughs> off onto a UN conversation, but since you mentioned it, I think that it's, you know, uh, I, I think it's worthy to explore that, to say, okay, uh, the dynamics are changing. India, which, as I said, 2025, uh, they, and, and right now they're talking about 1.4 billion 
uh, person to 1.7 billion, I think is the last number that I looked at, uh, you know, in terms of persons in there. So we are moving into a dynamic whereby the world influence is changing both from trade as well as by population. I mean, you could look at the current European membership of the P5. You basically have France and, and Britain. Um, and then you could actually just keep it with the conversation within Europe. Are either of those countries or are both of those countries as important as Germany, which was defeated in World War II at this stage of history? Right. And should Germany supplant one of those two? Or right. should both of them go? Uh, my own personal opinion is that, you know, France at this stage of history is not nearly as important as it was at the close of World War II. Britain, because of its market capacity, I think, and its markets, um, uh, its financial markets, um, still has more, still has some influence. Clearly, it's not the British Empire of old. Um, and I think Germany, you can make a very fine argument that given the strength of its economy, its stability of its economy, um, in the context of Europe, uh, that it deserves to be on in that mix. Uh, well, we only have a few <laughs> closing minutes here uh, to talk about it. And this last point that we've discussed as far as the world geopolitics and the um, the potentials for change within the UN could be a program all by itself, as you know uh, uh, from the things that you've covered. Uh, I want to just leave folks when uh, one one last piece because I I, I, I want to just elaborate on the your, the Pulitzer that you won. I just want you to tell folks what it is. I mentioned it at the start of the opening of the program. Why don't we close with just telling folks what it means? Because I'm I'm just. I, I'm ecstatic about the fact you have a uh, Pulitzer uh, Prize uh, winning uh, author, uh, journalist. journalist here with me. So we have about a minute, so you can yeah. just tell them quickly what that, what that means. Yes. What uh, that is. Uh, to be clear about it, I shared a Pulitzer as a member of a team uh, uh, in 1984 at the Boston Globe. We published a series in 1983 called The Race Factor. I that looked that. Yes. at, uh, it was two parts to it, two groups of stories, 13 parts. The first part uh, looked at different major sectors of the Boston economy and looked at basically the black presence in employment in those major sectors of the economy. The second part of it compared Boston to uh, six other cities around the country in matters of race. Uh, in narrow terms in each place. I went to Philadelphia where I looked at mobility between ethnic neighborhoods, and I went to Miami where I looked at uh, economics. Well, Ken, I'm, uh, thank you for joining me on International Forum. It's been an exciting discussion about India, the UN. Uh, I want to bring you back. We can explore some other issues, but again, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. This is Roy Cohen, producer and director of the International Forum Show. Thank you for watching, and we welcome your comments to our email address, international.forum at yahoo.com.